Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Barry Erickson, and I'm Community Engagement Coordinator here at Wheaton Public Library. We are delighted to bring you this program on exploring the Winfield Mounds. Brian and Joyce Osberg are local residents, having lived in DuPage County since 1985. Brian spent most of his working life as a computer scientist at AT&T Bell Labs Nokia in Naperville, while Joyce worked at Abbott Labs as a molecular biologist. Once retired, they started Be Historic, a YouTube channel dedicated to regional history and prehistory, producing over 50 documentaries. So please join me in welcoming Brian and Joyce Osberg. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> I'll try to, sp to speak uh, loudly then in that case, like that. Okay. Thanks to everyone for coming out tonight and spending part of your evening with us. Uh, this is a great audience. Um, first the eclipse, now this. This is more fun than human beings should be allowed to have. Um, as uh, Barry uh, pointed out, my name is Brian Osberg and that's my wife, Joyce Osberg, and we, we uh, formed the YouTube channel Be Historic about four years ago, and uh, we've been making uh, videos ever since. We're up to about 68 now, 67, 68 videos on regional history and prehistory for the area. And uh, a special thanks to the Wheaton Public Library as well as Barry for setting this talk up and providing this very nice venue for us to talk at. Uh, we are not archaeologists, as uh, Barry pointed out. I was a computer scientist in my former life, and Joyce was a molecular biologist in her former life, and now we're doing this for fun. Um, and uh, But it's a lot of work. We probably spend about 60 to 70 hours a week on our YouTube channel. So it's pretty much a, a full-time job for us, including including some of the talks that we do here. Um, we, we do want to say, though, that we have consulted with uh, multiple archaeologists on this topic, uh, archaeologists such as Doug Cullen, who wrote perhaps the, the definitive paper on the Winfield Mounds back in 1989, Peter Geraci of the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, who's also studied many of the artifacts associated with the Winfield Mounds. We've also consulted with the Illinois State Archaeological Survey going back 20, 25 years. When we first started researching the Winfield Mounds, we contacted them and they sent us out a lot of information that we've been able to build on ever since. We also spoke to the DuPage County Forest Preserve District, their naturalists, who also about 20, 25 years ago, uh, put us on the right track for finding out a lot of the information associated with the Winfield Mounds. So this is a, a pretty big topic. We'll probably go a little bit long um, and we will do questions at the end. So uh, if uh, you can hold those to the end, that would be great. So what are the Winfield Mounds and where are they located? Uh, the Winfield Mounds, this is a modern map, of course, Google Maps, 2024. The Winfield Mounds are a single, uh, can be thought of as a single archeological site, but it properly consists of, of multiple sites. One is a habitation site, which sits at about this X. You can see the DuPage River meandering down about the center of your the screen right there. So there's a habitation site right along the west bank of the DuPage River, and we'll talk about why it was a habitation site from the excavations. And then about 300 feet from the river, there was a set of three uh, earthworks, mounds, conical mounds that were about 30 feet in diameter, one to three feet in height. And uh, the mounds are known to archaeologists as 11DU1, 11DU2, 11DU3, and 11 DU-33, and 1-1 stands for Illinois. This is a somewhat old numbering system invented by the Smithsonian in the 30s and 40s. Uh, I think Illinois is 11th alphabetically of the initial 48 states, which is why uh, it's we're 11. Um, DU is for DuPage County, and the number is for the number uh, that they were recorded in sequence as they were officially documented. So. We have, with the Winfield Mounds, DU1, DU2, and DU3, the first three archaeological uh, sites that were documented within DuPage County. And then a little later, we had DU33, which uh, we'll talk about in just a little bit. 
Now, the site is located about a thousand feet to the west of Winfield Road. So here's Winfield Road running north south. It's about a thousand feet to the west. Geneva Road is about a half mile to the north. And uh, High Lake Road is about a half mile to the south, along with downtown Winfield. And you can see from this map that we have subdivisions, modern subdivisions that dominate the area to the east. We have subdivisions to the west, and we have the DuPage County Hospital complex, that massive complex to the south. So it's, it's surrounded by a lot of civilization at this point. The site is accessible if you want to visit it on your own via automobile, and you can park along Winfield Road, particularly up near Geneva Road. There's some limited parking along the side of the road. You can also park by Hedges Museum and simply walk across into the trail system, which will take you back into the mound area. So that's by automobile. You can also visit the mounds via bicycle or walking if you take the Geneva Spur of the Illinois Prairie Path, which is right here. And that will enable you to uh, just hike back into the, the mound side area. But note that bicycles are not allowed, well, you're not allowed to ride your bicycles back because this is a sacred site after all. It was a, a special spiritual place for the Native Americans. So they do not condone riding your bikes back there. You have to walk your bikes back. And uh, it's, it's not a big deal to do that. The trail is is reasonably uh, is a reasonable trail, so it, walking the bikes is not a big problem. Topographically, the site is located on a bluff. There's a low bluff about 20 to 25 feet high off the west bank of the DuPage River. And the site is located today in woodland, surrounded by meadow, prairie, and marshland, which hasn't changed much actually, as we'll see in the past few hundred years. And so it would have been an ideal topography for hunting wild game and fowl, for gathering plants in the marshlands for medicinal purposes, as well as for eating as well. Uh, for eating as well. Um, it's also located interestingly by a crook in the west branch of the DuPage River. Um, now, habitation sites often show up near these bends in the river like that. And one idea, one theory behind that is that uh, it was an ideal place to hook up fish traps for Native Americans that lived there at the time. There might be other reasons, but that's one idea that's been hypothesized at this point. The woodland consists, if you go back there, you'll see a lot of shagbark hickory and oak trees. And those are likely part of the primeval forest that existed uh, for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. The shagbark hickory nuts would have been used for food and they would have been collected. You see them all spread all, all over the ground as you walk back to the habitation site. The oak would have been used, the acorns for food, as well as the uh, bark for tanning uh, deer skin and other uh, animal skins and so on. So there would have been a lot of very good resources in this area, which they would have exploited uh, when they lived here. Now, one other thing I wanted to point out from this particular image. Oh, and I should mention too, they were originally known as the player mounds before they were the Winfield mounds. And the reason why they were called the player mounds is because when they were originally recorded, the landowner at the time, a man by the name of Milton Player, uh, was the landowner. And so they uh, were named the player mounds initially. The other thing I wanted to point out is Remember I talked about the Geneva Spur of the Illinois Prairie Path. Well, remember that was initially part of the CA&E, another topic we like to talk about. It was originally part of the Geneva Spur of the CA&E and the railroad line originally ran straight through here across the river, straight across where these subdivisions are to this line of trees and it continued on to, to near Pleasant Hill Road. You can still see a lot of the artifacts associated with the railroad there. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because you can still see the remnants of the bridge that goes over the west branch of the DuPage River. The two abutments are still there. There's three piers still in the water and they actually play a role in the story of the excavation of this mound, which we'll talk about shortly. So I just wanted to bring that up to, to highlight the fact that the ca &E railroad was running by this site for many, many years. 
So going back in the history of this site, going back to the 1830s and, and that time frame, the land was originally populated for thousands of years by indigenous people, most recently the Sauk, the Fox, and the Potawatomi. With the forced removal of the Native Americans in the 1830s, the first owner of the, the land was the U.S. government, and they, they parceled the land up into allotments, and they used the public land survey system, the PLSS, also known as the uh, Township Range Section System, to create a grid-like system on the landscape, which enabled them to sell the land to purchasers coming in from the east and the south, primarily. But in any event, the mound, this is a map from 1842. This is one of the original survey maps of Winfield Township, uh, DuPage County from 1842. And as I, I was talking to a few folks earlier, it's a wealth of information. If you go back and look at these maps, they're on Illinois Digital Archives if you're interested in looking at them. And from this map, you see some very interesting features. For instance, so this is the approximate site of the mound site. You see marshland to the Northwest, that marshland is still pretty much there today. You also see marshland to the south. You also see, this is the timber line right here. So everything at, beyond this is scattered timber. So scattered forest going back from this stretch onwards to the west to about right here, you can see. So this landscape has changed quite a bit in the past 200 years the river running through it. Here, this is open meadow, prairie, and you can see even in 1842, the land was still uh, under cultivation at this time. So the, the land was divided up into townships and sections. Winfield Township is six miles by six miles in size, as was typical for townships. The townships were made up of 36 sections. Each section was one mile square. So this is section 12 which is one mile square. And this PLSS system, we believe, played a role in why the mounds survived into the 20th and 21st century. And we'll talk about that in, in a wee bit. You can also see on this map, by the way, we've all, oh, I think Gary Mill Road, I think, is that familiar to anybody? There's Gary's Mill and Dam right here at this bend in the river. So just very interesting to see these features in the map showing up so early on. Now that gentleman to the lower right is by the name, man by the name of Proctor Price Cooley. That's a pretty cool name. Uh, Proctor Price Cooley was from Massachusetts. He was a farmer uh, born in 1806. And he came and was one of the initial purchasers of much of the land in section 12. So this was a big chunk of land, if you think about it. Section 12 is one mile square. But he didn't own all of it, but he owned a big chunk of it. And he bought that in the early 1840s. Now, he died in um, 1878 at the age of 72. And he's buried in the Jewel Road or the Jewel Cemetery along Jewel Road in northwestern Illinois, if you know where that is. It's a little cemetery tucked away back in a subdivision, Champion Forest Road, uh, tucked away back there. You'll find this little cemetery that has a lot of the early pioneers, uh, including the Jewell family, the Cooley family, you'll see the Cooley name uh, prominently mentioned amongst the gravestones, um, buried back in there. So some of this history starts to come to life when you start to see the, the places where these people lived, where they died and where they're buried and so on. So fast forward um, to 1874, we were just looking at an 1842 map, now we're 1874. And there's some interesting things in this, the plat map for DuPage County at that time in Winfield Township. And now we can see that by 1874, the, the ownership of the land is transferred to another person by the name of Casper Dam or Casper Dom. Again, this is section 12 right here. And there we see the location of the, of the, uh, the mound site. And young man was act, asking earlier about has the landscape changed? Well, you can see just in the 30 years where it originally showed timber going back all the way in this direction, we start to see the land being cleared out for agriculture, for farmers. 
you can see they're they're clearing the land of large swaths tracts of land opening it up for cultivation which as you'd expect i mean people were wanting to transform the land into farms and so they needed to remove a lot of the trees in the area but what's interesting about this particular map is at that time 1874 the mound area the habitation site area that we're going to talk about was relatively free of trees at that time Now, Dam ended up uh, moving to Fremont, Nebraska, after he married a local woman, Margaret Hahn, in 1876, and he ended up dying in uh, Fremont, Nebraska, in 1900. And if the locals knew about the earthworks at this time, which they may or may not have known about them, um, initially they would have been referred to as the Cooley Mounds, and you know where this is going. Uh, now they would have been known as the Dam Mounds in the 1874 time frame. Sorry to telegraph that. But, uh, so now we fast forward another 30 years. This is the 1904 plat map. And by this time, the land had passed into the hands of another person by the name of John Player. John Player was a machinist from England, born in 1848, so he was a little bit younger than Caspar Dahm, who was born in 1838. However, John Player does not seem to have been the person who lived on the land or cultivated it. Um, John Player was the father of Milton Player. Milton Player was born in 1874 in Iowa. And uh, uh, I, we believe that John Player simply mortgaged the, land, the, the property to his uh, son, and his son paid off the land over a period of time. So this is why the official plat maps and the the deeds would show that John Player is the, uh, the actual owner of the land. Now, a few of the things that are interesting. You can see where the, the Player household would have resided along. This is County Farm Road, right along here. Although sometimes this was referred to as Winfield Road, by the way. And there, there is no Winfield Road at this point. So this is County Farm Road, sometimes referred to as Winfield Road. And the players would have lived along County Farm Road. And one of the reasons why uh, we referred to the PLSS, the Township Range and Section mapping as being perhaps critical to the survival of these mounds is because of how the section was laid out. Um, here is Section 12, you can see. And the government sold uh, these parcels of land by, by the sections, or they would sell them by a half section or a quarter section. And you can see for section 12 that the majority of the farmland is to the east of the river, and the smaller piece is to the east or the west of the river. So for farmers like uh, Milton Player, the majority of his tillable property would have been to the east of the river. Now, there were very few bridges back then. Bridges were expensive, right? So if John Milton Player wanted to visit the west portion of his property, he most likely had to come down to High Lake Road or up to Geneva Road to get over there. So it's probably not something he did on a daily basis. It's probably something he did periodically. So it's highly likely that these parcels of land, these smaller parcels of land to the west of the river, ending right there, would have been used for uh, managed woodland for wood for fuel or for timber for uh, uh, lumber that they would use on the farm. It could have been for pasturage for uh, dairy cows. It could have been for orchards. But uh, the key point is it was not tilled. It was not plowed. And one of the reasons why we know that is, is because if it was, the, uh, uh, the soil probably would have looked differently in the soil stratigraphy. The other thing is, is that the effigy mounds are very subtle features in the landscape, and they probably would have, with uh, a handful of years of plowing, would have been obliterated if, if they had been plowed. So it's highly likely that that area of land was never plowed, um, and so those mounds happen to survive uh, to the present day. Now, Milton Player is this gentleman off to the to the right of the image, and that's his wife, Elizabeth Reed player, and they lived on their farm for the first half of the 20th century and raised a very large family. And it was, <clears throat> they owned the property when it was first 
discovered, if you will, by uh, the first excavations. So does that make sense, what, what I described a few moments ago about, by pure chance, how these sections were divided up and by the smaller piece away from the roads uh, would not have been as actively farmed as the larger pieces closer to the road. Does that make any sense or? Yeah, okay, good. So we go forward a few years to 1908. This is the, the topographical map from uh, the US Geological Survey. And uh, this also has some interesting features. From this, we can see that there was marshland to the east. There was marshland to the west, a little further, further to the west, as well as to the north. And the mound site sits upon this rise. Remember, we talked about it was a, a low bluff along the west branch of the DuPage River. We can see from the, the topographical map that there's a, a rise here overlooking, overlooking the river. In 1908, we still see no sign of Winfield Road, but there's County Farm Road with the farmer's residences along it. And it's 1908. So this is the Elgin branch of the CA&E right there. But there's at this point, there's no Geneva Spur of the CA&E. I was just looking at that thinking, where is the G Geneva Spur? And I realized, oh, that was until 1909. So which brings us to about the 1930 time frame. This is circa 1930, another plat map, which are very interesting to explore. By this time, Milton Player owns the deed for the property, as we can see from the deed map. Um, uh, also, by this time, we know that Milton Player had chased off on one or two occasions vandals that were digging into the, the mounds. So he reportedly chased off two or three uh, groups of young men that were digging holes in the center of these mounds, looking for trophies, looking for treasure, um, not understanding that effigy mounds typically don't hold things like that. But nonetheless, when they d dug into those mounds, they did great damage to each of them. And they, they pretty much dug into all of the mounds. And we'll see that play a role in the, the, the actual archaeology that took place a short time later. In the late 1920s, a local amateur archaeologist by the name of Dick Cook of Wheaton um, was hiking along the west branch of the DuPage River when he spotted the mounds, or perhaps somebody put him onto it, we're not sure. And he was a collector of Native American artifacts as well as other antiquities. So this immediately interested him, and he asked permission of Milton Player if he could dig a trench in one of the mounds, and Milton Player gave his approval. So in about 1929, he dug a one and a half foot 10 to 20 foot long trench in the north face of the southernmost mound, which was DU2, became to be known as DU2 later on. And um, he didn't find anything. Now, this was not a, a true archaeological excavation. It was a meandering uh, trench that he dug through. And he was looking, again, for artifacts that he could collect. But he was unsuccessful in doing that. He was, uh, as a collector, um, he did have quite a collection, uh, I read years later. And he was also, interestingly, Dick Cook was the master of ceremonies for the Wheaton Centennial in 1932. And uh, the, the Centennial featured Native American artifacts because he was interested in them. So Cook digs a trench, doesn't find anything. And so in a bit of frustration, he did the right thing and he contacted the University of Chicago requesting them with players' permission to come and take a look at the, uh, the mound site and see what they thought about it. Again, we're 1930, there's County Farm Road, and there's still no Winfield Road. Winfield Road wouldn't show up for another 30 years or more. Oh, the other thing that's interesting on this map is we see the origins of the DuPage County Hospital complex the tuberculosis sanatorium right here. I thought that was interesting. I'm sorry. Ah, yeah, oh, Joyce just reminded me. And there is the Geneva Spur. <laughs> so the CA&E Geneva Spur is there, and that's going to play a role 
in this story. The Geneva Spur went in about 1909 and was there until 1937. So it was there just in time for the story. So enter the University of Chicago. A few years, within a few years after Dick Cook requested them to come out, uh, so came out the University of Chicago. And at that time, the University of Chicago had an, a, a nationally renowned or internationally renowned archaeological program. The anthropology department was led by a man by the name of Faye Cooper Cole to the far right of the image there. And at that time, he was using the anthropology department to send out the graduate students, undergraduate students, uh, faculty members all throughout the US Midwest to document and record many of the archeological sites in the US Midwest. And we, we actually have to thank them for doing that because otherwise they might've been obliterated before they were ever recorded. And that work actually was the foundation for the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. Later that was transferred to Champaign. They took that over, but initially it was started by the University of Chicago that did a lot of the early work. And they promulgated something called the Chicago Method, which was a much more methodical approach to archaeology and archaeological excavations at that time. Since they were of such renown, they had a lot of influence community. And it's not to say that there weren't archaeologists already doing these methods that I'll describe momentarily, but what they did is they, they brought a much greater discipline and rigor to archaeological excavations that had taken place prior to this. So what, what was the Chicago method? Well, it involved doing a formal survey and mapping, careful survey and mapping of the archeological site, pinning it down in the landscape exactly where it was, laying out a formal grid uh, covering the entire site so that you could two-dimensionally map any artifact found within the archeological site exactly where it was found and even within the grid itself taking section cuts. So section cuts enabled you to identify the depth of artifacts. So now in three dimensions, you could place an artifact back in the excavation site, just, to, just as it was found, and including soil stratigraphies, sorting out how the soils were laid down over time and being able to determine, is this a natural formation or is this something that is uh, 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 artificial or human made? So this is all part of the Chicago method, and it pretty much influenced archaeology in the United States in the ensuing years. Now, Faye Cooper Cole did exactly what most department heads would do at this time. Technically, he was the lead of the Winfield Mounds excavation, but he quickly uh, delegated this off to one of his graduate students, uh, George K. Newman, the young man to the left of the, the image here. Newman was born in 1908 in Germany and emigrated, I think, about 1920 to the United States. And he was supported in the dig by other graduate students, about four or five other graduate students, as well as a team of undergraduates who were taking a Faye Cooper Cole anthropology class in spring semester of 1931. And uh, it flows downhill, so they did most of the heavy lifting and digging associated with the dig, the undergrads. Now, I promised you that there's a connection to the CAED, and this is where it comes in. Remember, one of the first things that they did with the Chicago Method was to officially survey and carefully survey the site and pin it down in the landscape. So this is from this is an actual drawing from Newman's 1931 report, surveyed on April 18, 1931, by George K. Newman and two other graduate students. These are the three mounds, DU1, DU2, DU3. And they used the method of triangulation. Remember, back at this time, there was no GPS. You had to nail things down by landmarks in the landscape. Things that weren't going to, weren't likely to be moved anytime in the near future. So just up, up along this line is the west abutment of the ca &E bridge going over the west branch of the DuPage River. So from that corner of that abutment, they took the measurement to DU1, and then they drew, they went a true north line, magnetic north, up into the railway line to the Geneva Spur of the Aurora Elgin Railroad, as, as they documented it. And by triangulation, they were able to determine the fairly exact location of DU1 in the landscape. So trigonometry is something that we all learned in high school. 
And uh, this is probably to plus or minus five to 10 feet. They were probably able to take this measurement. And once they had that for DU1, via trigonometry and a couple of measurements, they were able to determine the exact location of DU2 and DU3. So that's one of the tie-ins to the uh, CA. There's, there's one more coming, actually. So they recorded three mounds, as I mentioned, DU1, DU2, DU3, the first recorded, archeolo recorded archaeological sites in DuPage County at that time. And Newman selected DU1, the northwesterly mound, for excavation. And he did so because at that time it was the least disturbed of the three mounds. So they had been, uh, it was, the, the mounds were pockmarked by this time, excuse me, by pot hunters, by vandals and so on, looking for treasures and so on within the mound, usually unsuccessfully. Now there's a few interesting pictures on this uh, slide. One is to the leftmost picture, that's Faye Cooper Cole. That's likely Dick Cook, the gentleman who we talked about earlier, who dug the trench in DU2 and uh, invited uh, Faye Cooper Cole <clears throat> and his students in to look at the site. The other interesting picture here is very likely of D1. They took pictures of uh, fairly high quality pictures, although this is this is a Xerox copy, unfortunately. But nonetheless, it still shows some important features. One is that this looks like a perfectly formed effigy mound. Uh, very nice. Um, if you saw the mounds in the 1980s or 1990s, it didn't look anything like this. Um, it looked very different and much, much, much worse. So. This is intriguing just to see that picture like that. The other thing that's fascinating is the tree line. You can see the trees are some distance behind it, many tens of feet behind this mound. There's one tree here off to the left, but generally speaking, the mound site is relatively free of trees at this particular time and undergrowth. So the University of Chicago dig started on Friday, April 17th, 1931, and it, it was done within a matter of a few weekends. Um, it, it proceeded so quickly. George Newman standing in the trench of DU1 with a fellow, uh, uh, some of his fellow graduate students. Um, they probably took the University of Chicago truck or van that they used for these local uh, archeological expeditions. The undergraduates who did all the heavy, heavy work they likely took the CA and E, um, which would have taken them right to the Winfield Road stop along County Farm Road, which was right across the street from the player residence. And many of these students are said to have stayed with the players for those two weekends while they were uh, participating in this dig. So that's the second tie into the CA and E. So the CA and E played a role in uh, the 1931 dig. Note too that the from this picture, you can see that both young men and young women participated in the dig. They would have been enrolled in Faye Cooper Cole's anthropology class, archaeology class, in the spring semester of uh, 1931. In the picture to the right, they're standing in a section cut. Remember, we talked about section cuts, a vertical cut across the diameter of the, the mound. This is Newman standing with uh, five other graduate students. Many of these folks went on to illustrious careers in anthropology and archeology span in the faculty of other universities throughout the United States. And there's some other very interesting things about these pictures that you can take away. This is the same picture without those people standing in it, the section cut through the center. Um, for instance, you can see the, the grid stakes marked out every five feet forming the grid pattern uh, on the archeological site. You can see the robber pit, the vandal pit, smack in the middle. And this is after it was filled in to some degree. It would have gone down deeper as we'll see in the section cuts in a short while. You can see the spoil heaps that came out of the mound. This is only about halfway through at this point. So they generated some fairly substantial spoil heaps that surrounded the mound uh, once they were done. And finally, look again at the trees. Look how far back, there's many tens of feet. I believe that's looking east towards the river. Um, but you can see many tens of feet before you see uh, uh, any trees uh, nearby the mounds. 
So again, if you've been to the mounds any time in the past 10, 20 years, you know that that's quite different from what it is today. The other interesting thing here up on the slide is this is a newspaper article from April 24th, 1931 from the Wheaton, Illinoisan, And they wrote quite an extensive article on the Winfield Mounds dig. Um, and it's rather sensationalistic. Uh, a lot of the finds described in the article were not mentioned by George Newman in his report that he wrote up a few months later, suggesting that uh, Newman, upon further review, didn't think too much of, of, of them, whereas the reporter did. Now, this is a facsimile of the diagram that George K. Newman uh, put in his report in 1931 regarding the DU-1 excavation. Remember, this is the northwesterly most mound. And there's this particular diagram shows many different features. First, they dug three test pits, northwest, northeast, and southeast. Each of these test pits was three feet by three feet in dimension and three feet deep. And the purpose of these test pits was it gave them a profile of the natural surrounding area. By using that baseline, they could then determine, is it different for the mound site? Is this a natural feature, or is this something that's somehow been modified by human beings? So this is an important part of the Chicago method as well, by the way. Then they created the, the grid system. The grid system was 40 feet north to south, 45 feet east to west. The excavation proceeded from the west to the east. They took off section by section, moving west to east, five feet at a time, because remember the, the stakes are five feet apart. This orange line represents the area that was excavated. So everything within the orange dotted line was excavated. Was there much left of the mound after this? Yeah, there was hardly anything left of the mound. Um, there was only a few small sections remaining after they dug it out, and it was surrounded by spoil heaps. The other thing that's interesting here is this is the profile of the crater. Based on the, the distance of the stakes, you can see that this is about an eight-foot diameter crater that was dug by the pot hunters in previous attempts at digging into the mound. So the, the excavation proceeded over two weekends, as I mentioned. And with about 20 to 30 undergrads, they were able to pull this off. Um, they took section cuts, north to south, north to south section cuts, all along the, uh, as they proceeded along with the excavation. And so what did they find? Well, they found a few very interesting things. First, they found a pot shirt right there, right on the lip of the, of the, uh, the pits that had been dug by the uh, vandals earlier in the 1920s. And this potsherd was 3 16 of an inch thick. It was brown and gray modeled in coloring, but 3 16 of an inch thick. This was very thin, thin piece of pottery. Newman drew this uh, rough drawing of the pot as based on the radius of curvature of the, the potsherd and believed it to be about yay big, small pot about that, that size. This is a more modern rendition of the, the same thing, just to give you a better idea of what it might have looked like. The other thing about the potsherd, though, that um, made it less usable was they realized from the soil stratigraphies that we'll show in a moment that it was found in the debris uh, from the, the hole that was dug earlier that took it completely out of context from its original location in the mound. So in other words, the, the pot hunters dug it out, threw it to the side or didn't notice it uh, in the, the, the soil that was tossed about around the, the hole that was dug in the ground. So that made it difficult to use it in any kind of scientific way for dating. But as we'll talk about later, it does suggest dating associated with this mound nonetheless. The other uh, very important find was what Newman interpreted to be a bundle burial. Now, this bundle burial was just right at the edge of this section cut. And in fact, they exposed the bundle burial at the bottom of the section cut as they were cleaning off the surface. And that's when they saw what Newman recognized as human bones. 
Now, Newman, <laughs> Newman uh, became a very noteworthy physical anthropologist um, over time. So I think we can trust most of his observations is what I'm suggesting. He uh, later in his career, he was often called in by the Indiana authorities because he moved to Indiana, uh, because he was used for identifying human remains, crime scenes, as well as he was a physical anthropologist on other archeological digs. He was noted for his expertise on recognizing human remains and the various bones involved. So he, he spotted what he thought were, whoops, whoops, I'm jumping ahead. My apologies. He spotted multiple bones within this bundle burial. Uh, Sorry about that. And they included a, a, a parietal, a portion of the uh, back of the skull, the, uh, the left mastoid portion of the temporal, the lower uh, left back of the skull, uh, fragments of a tibia, fragments of a femur, uh, a rate, a, an ulna from the forearm, and a clavicle, the collarbone. So these are bones he recognized, but unfortunately uh, they were in such fragile condition that when they attempted to remove these bones, they fell to pieces. And he said nothing could be preserved as a result of this. So it's very unfortunate that those bones had laid there undisturbed for perhaps a thousand years or more. And finally, when they're dug up they're they're destroyed as part of the excavation. So these are part of the soil stratigraphies. They took several soil stratigraphies across the north-south sections of the mound. And this is the centermost soil stratigraphy. This is five feet to the left, and this is five feet to the right. And again, this tells us some interesting things. We can see the clay layer. The clay layer uh, is this, the hash marks, vertical hash marks. So you can see where the, the, the clay layer was above, below the soil immediately to the, the side of the mound. You can also see how deep the vandals pits were dug, quite deep. And fortunately, they didn't get down to the bundle burial, which was just at the clay layer. So you can imagine that the initial burial, they dug down to the clay layer, inserted the bundle burial, and then perhaps covered it over with some topsoil. Perhaps they built the mound at that point, we don't know. But it would have been just above the clay layer, right here. Remember I said that they, they noted that the potsherd was found in the spoil heaps of the, the vandal pit. And they knew that because by doing the careful soil stratigraphy, they could see that the original mound surface was here, and this was the debris from the vandal pit, and the potsherd was found within that layer. So they knew at that point that it had come from this pit and all you can say with any confidence that it was somewhere above the bundle burial, but exactly where six inches down, 16 inches down, we cannot know. So Newman conjectured that there was a habitation site along the, uh, the river to the east of the mound site, although he didn't give any reasoning behind that nor did he test that hypothesis with any additional excavations on this particular uh, archeological ex excavation. He did, however, do a detailed write-up of the 1931 excavation that he uh, turned into Faye Cooper Cole within a few months of the excavation. That included detailed diagrams, site surveys, drawings, detailed observations um, of the dig. And, Unfortunately, that was never published in a peer-reviewed journal or in any kind of periodical, which is very unfortunate. It collected dust in the archives of the uh, Anthropology Department of the University of Chicago for decades. It's probably because either he or probably Faye Cooper Cole did not believe it was worthy of publication, which is unfortunate. It's unfortunate that you dig away a, a sacred site, a structure, potential burial site, and you do not even bother to record it in any kind of way. That's the unfortunate part. And as far as we know, DU-1, the mound site that they excavated, was left in a complete state of disrepair. Um, 
So it was a shallow crater surrounded by spoil heaps. And if you saw the mound in the 1980s or 1990s, that's pretty much what it looked like. Um, when I remember when it was pointed out by Jack McKee, there's the mound. Um, you, you literally had to do a double take uh, because you, you would not have known that there was a earthwork there prior to that. Now, Newman uh, ultimately joined the faculty at the University of Indiana. He became a noted physical anthropologist, like I mentioned, and was often called in to identify uh, rem human remains on uh, criminal sites as well as archaeological sites. And he died in 1971. So that's the story of the University of Chicago excavation. But there's more to come, and Joyce is going to tell us what happened next in the Winfield Mound story. Hi. Milton Player retired from farming in 1947, and he passed at the age of 73. He passed away 10 years later in 1957. His wife, Elizabeth Reed Player, passed away in 1960. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, the DuPage County Forest Preserve began buying up land in that area. And you can see this is the 1973 DuPage County plat map, and you can see how it's different from the earlier maps. You can see where the Forest Preserve is now owning many tracts of land that had been owned by individual farmers. One of the tracts of land that they purchased was the 72 remaining acres of the player farm that contained the Winfield Mounds or the player mounds at that point. And that is marked by the yellow X. In January of, and this land that the forces are um, bought up, they by they added to it, uh, it was a total of about 260, 280 acres, and that became the Winfield Mounds Forest Preserve. In January of 1975, James Edward Jennings, whose photograph is on the right, was walking along the path in the Winfield Mounds Forest Preserve on the west branch, west side of the west branch of the DuPage River with his son. Jennings was a professor of archaeology at Wheaton College. He was originally from West Virginia, but had come out to the area to attend Wheaton College, where he had earned his bachelor's and master's degrees. In addition to teaching archaeology, he had also participated in multiple archaeological digs in the Middle East. Now, as he and his son are walking along the path on that the bluff near the river, he looked down and saw chert or flint flakes. Now, as an archaeologist, he knew that these chert flakes were associated with the manufacture of stone tools. So he then contacted the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, or ISAS. That's a mouthful. I'm not going to keep saying that. Um, he contacted ISAS and proposed that he excavate at that site with ISAS collaboration and supervision. And ISAS agreed, and they designated the site as DU-33. So since, um, the, the, since Cook had first, and Newman had first done their excavations early in the 1920s and 30s, and the, Dupe, the archaeological sites had been numbered, we went from one, two, three from the mounds up to just 33 for this habitation site. Jennings Wheaton College excavation started in April of that year, so it just took a couple months to get going. His team was largely his spring undergraduate archaeology class, which sounds familiar from the University of Chicago excavations. The photograph at the left is showing Jennings and um, the students in his group. They, the students and Jennings also were assisted by upperclassman Kenneth Hoagland, who was like an assistant director and helped just to oversee this, the dig at the site. They had quite a few goals for this excavation. They wanted to conduct a site survey and establish the occupational patterns on both sides of the West Branch of the DuPage River. They also wanted to conduct excavations at the DU-33 site in order to determine the extent and type of habitation at that site. 
And finally, they wanted to reinvestigate the um, 1931 University of Chicago excavation at DU1 and excavate a second mound from the Effigy Mound Triad. A lot to do in a spring quarter of, of school. The photograph on the right is again of the site as it was now by the mid 1970s. Um, the wooded section, you can see the DuPage River going through in the middle. The wooded section lower down from that would be around where the mounds and then the DU-33 site would be. And the road to, to the, the north or top, although it's actually in life, it's the east, that is now Winfield Road. So the team started their um, project by field walking the site. This is a non-invasive method that involves a systematic and methodical method or means of walking the site, looking for artifacts lying on the surface. So they're not digging yet. They're just looking for anything that is on the surface. And they record what artifact they found, if it's a, a lithic, which would be an arrowhead or a spearhead, ceramics, which would be pottery sherds, or pieces of worked stone, bone, or shell. And if they find something, what they find, the type of artifact is recorded and its location is recorded. They then will plot all the finds and areas with a high concentration of certain um, finds would suggest a possible use for that area. So in their um, field walking on both sides of the river, they did find ceramics and lithics, but the greatest concentration of them was up at the DU-33 site where Jennings had found the church flakes walking along the path. So this suggested to them that that site was um, possibly used for the manufacture of stone tools. So the team then followed up their field walking by putting in some shallow excavations at the DU-33 site. The first thing they did was they set up a four by four grid that was made of six by six foot squares with a narrow walkway in between. That's the diagram on the left side. Those six by six foot squares were then subdivided into three foot by three foot quadrants. And 12, this resulted in 64 quadrants. 12 of those 64 quadrants were then randomly selected to be excavated. The brown shaded quadrants are the ones that were chosen to be excavated. Do, choosing their quadrants this way removed any form of bias as far as what where they were doing the excavation. So you know, they couldn't say, well, you missed something because you only concentrated at this area. It, level the playing field, so to speak. Each quadrant was carefully trawled away. You can see the students working in their, their section and one of the excavated quadrants at the bottom. Any artifacts they found were recorded. Soil stratigraphies were recorded. Um, unfortunately for the students that this grid system was right along the pathway through the forest preserve. And what they found happened is when they were not there working, people would walk through their pits, dirt bikers rode through the pits. Uh, sometimes their stakes and excavation tools were pulled up and tossed into the river. But they, they persisted anyway, the students had to get their grade, but no, just kidding. <laughs> um, in addition to the, the grid system, they also put in two shallow six by six foot pits several tens of feet west of the path. And they found cer um, ceramics and lithics in those pits too. If you look at the diagram on the right, down at the bottom is the, the grid system for the 64 um, squares or quadrants. A few weeks into their excavation, the team put in another large pit far to the, several feet to the north, that arrow there is pointing north. So they went north of their grid system. And they did this because they had noticed that in the dirt that had been 
disturbed and dug up kind of by the dirt bikers, which they were a pain, but they're obviously helping them too, in a way here. They had found a high number of ceramic artifacts. So they put in a large pit up there and they found over 1500 ceramic pieces. So they put in another shallower pit just to the north of that deep pit. And they found a few artifacts there, but nothing like in the deep pit. So this suggested to them that that pit was the midden or garbage dump for the habitation site. So the final stage of the Wheaton College excavation in 1975 was to excavate a, another, another mound. And obviously from the photographs, the, the information that Brian put up, there wasn't much left of DU1. So they, you know, they looked at that, but the excavation was already done. So they chose to work on DU2. The diagram at the right is showing DU2. The top kind of light brown, yellowish green, whatever area, that is the area that Cook are excavated. So you can see, as Brian said, he, he dug long trenches, but not in a systematic way. Um, Wheaton College put in two L-shaped um, excavation pits on the southern face of the mound because Cook had excavated the northern face and he didn't find anything. So they chose to work on the southern face. Within those L-shapes are five by five foot grids. In addition to the two L-shaped pits, they put in a three by three foot test pit that was 30 feet northwest of the center of DU2 and about 15 feet beyond the border of DU2. The border would be the brown ring around there. The, um, the picture in the middle, there is Jennings and another one of the students at the DU2 excavation. Um, the image at the upper left is from the University of Chicago's um, Newman write-up showing the three mounds in relation to each other. The lower image is the headline for an article that occurred appeared in the Chicago Tribune in 1975, December of 1975, on the excavation. There were actually many newspaper reports published in 1975 about this ex excavation. And in fact, a few members of the team appeared on a five-minute TV spot with CBS anchor Bill Curtis. In their excavation of DU2, the team dug down, they, they trawled away the dirt in like six inch, inch increments and very carefully looking for and recording any artifacts that they found. The spoil from the, the dig, so the dirt they were removing, was carefully sieved and sifted in order to find any smaller artifacts. The image, the middle right, is showing the students sieving the spoil, looking for smaller artifacts. And the other photographs are of the students. They're obviously the excavation pits and measuring the depth of them. They took the outer squares of the L shape down to three to four feet in depth. The middle part of the trench, they went down to seven feet. And this was because they hypothesized that there might have been a wooden tomb buried below the soil surface in the middle of the tomb or the, the mound. They carefully um, recorded the sections of the mound as they were doing their excavation and the soil stratigraphies. But unfortunately for the Wheaton College students, like Cook's excavation, DU2 yielded very few or no artifacts in any of their pits. With the completion of the DU2 excavation, the um, spring 1975 project by Wheaton College came to a close in early June. Now, having successfully established, um, oh, I forgot this part as we go back. Um, <laughs> When the team was doing their excavations and in the, with the artifacts that they found, they were able to determine that there were actually two habitation zones on the bluff. 
the first one occurred around three to five inches below the soil surface. And artifacts from that band were dated to the late woodland period. A second layer of occupation was found deeper down at nine to 10 inches below the soil surface. And those artifacts were dated to the middle woodland time. Late woodland would have been like 1,000 to 1,500 years ago, and the middle woodland was about 2,000 years ago. So then having success successfully established that those two habitation zones were present at DU 33, Jennings wanted to come back the following year in the spring of 1976 and see if they could fine tune the dating and information about the village. Um, he may have realized that they bit off more than they could chew the previous year. So this year's goals were much more modest. They just wanted to precisely map the location and extent of the village. So where, more precisely where it was located on that bluff. Um, he again used his undergraduate students as the excavators. Kenneth Hoagland was again his assistant director. This time they focused um, more on the southern end of the DU-33 site. So they weren't re-excavating where they put in the grid of 64 squares. They went south from there. Because he wanted to see how far this village went north and south, they used a ladder grid system this time. That's shown on the right um, image. And this was five by five foot squares with a five by five foot walkway in between. And they ran north to south. So it was about a hundred feet north to south for this excavation. Um, and you can see in the left picture here, the Jennings and some of the students excavating in, on this grid system. In this excavation, the students were instructed just to go down four to five inches. So they really were just looking for that upper habitation level, the late woodland period. And they again, you know, carefully recorded finds, sifted their the spoil, you know, recorded the sections and stratigraphies of the site. Um, and this site too yielded many artifacts, ceramics and lithics. And they were again dated to the late woodland period. This is a photograph taken by Jennings in the mid 1970s from a small airplane. And he is looking north onto the site. You can see the DuPage River, West Branch of the DuPage River coming through over on the right. And that the rightmost wooded section is where the mound and village sites would have been. And the pathways are probably half the forest preserve and part from the dirt bikers. <laughs> so as with the University of Chicago excavations, um, the results and methods from neither of the Wheaton College excavations, 1975 or 76, none of that was published in a peer review journal. A fairly comprehensive report was written by Kenneth Hoagland, and that was given to the DuPage County Forest Preserves and ISAS. But this was not, they weren't given that until September of 1978. The trenches from the 1975 and 1976 excavations were reported to have been filled back in. Reports in the 1980s, though, indicated that there were still large craters in both DU-1 and DU-2. So by 1980, after excavations by the University of Chicago and Wheaton College, by amateur archeologists, and pot hunters, there was still no formal documentation of this site. Nothing had been published in a peer reviewed journal. And if you're not really from a scientific background, the reason we keep mentioning this not in a peer reviewed journal is because that's how people in the field will publish something and other people who know a lot about it can ask specific questions or say like, no, that isn't right. Or did you do this? Did you not, not do that? It's a way of verifying the results. So 
it is important. None of us want to take medicine that has the results weren't from that study wasn't published in a peer reviewed journal and other scientists and doctors reviewed it. It's important in other fields too. In the early 1980s, Doug Cullen, an anthropology graduate student at the University of Chicago. So we're back, back into the city again now. He became interested in this site. But by this time, the mound site was in a pretty rough state. It was really more three craters rather than three mounds. There were random eroding piles of spoil scattered around the site. The undergrowth had taken over the site. There were even trees starting to grow up from in, the, in the mounds. Garbage and trash had been dumped here. There were mattresses, old rusted bed springs, shopping carts, broken glass, all of it was there. Um, Colin realized that further excavation at the site really wasn't gonna tell him much. Archeology span is a destructive science. Once a site is dug, it, unless you know very good records are kept, our, the artifacts recorded and noted, very good soil stratigraphies, the grids, everything that's, that the excavations from University of Chicago and Wheaton College are done. If that isn't done, once it's dug, that information is gone. Um, so fortunately for Doug Cullen, he had that information from the University of Chicago and Wheaton College. And so he chose to focus on reanalyzing the results from the excavations from those two universities and colleges. Here you can see the upper left and upper right photographs are showing what the mounds are looking like in the 1980s when Cullen was visiting them. Um, they, yeah, you can't, as Brian said, you really, you can, you wouldn't know they were a mound if someone didn't point it out to you. Um, Cullen re, um, obtained the 1931 Newman Report and in 1985, he visited Wheaton College, and they were very happy to give him access to Jennings' artifacts and the associated field reports. Cullen re-examined the artifacts for them, because even though it had only been 10 years or so since Jennings had done his excavations, um, the dating techniques and archaeological um, data were constantly being improved in the field. So he wasn't coming in being all arrogant, but there really was just more information available to him than there had been 10 years earlier. Um, Cullen wrote a report for the DuPage County Forest Preserves, and he outlined the, um, his results, the results of the excavations, the impact the excavations had on the mounds. He also recommended that the mound site be restored and protected, and by restored, it, to bring it back to the, as close as possible to its original state. Um, he also called for more rigorous criteria before any other excavations were done and more oversight of the site. A couple of years later in 1987, Cullen presented the paper, Winfield Mounds and Village, Forgotten Excavations in Northeast Illinois at the Midwest Archaeological Conference in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In his presentation, he outlined the work of Newman from the 1931 University of Chicago dig. He acknowledged their survey work and initial description of the site, as well as the rough dating of the site. He also acknowledged the work of Jennings uh, from we and the Wheaton College excavations, crediting them with the discovery for the habitation site and defining the extents of the temporary village and also for fine-tuning the dating to the Middle Woodland and Late Woodland periods. He credited both excavations with their detailed soil stratigraphies and um, baseline test pits. Without that, the artifacts would have been meaningless, or nearly meaningless. But Cullen then was able to go further in his examination of the artifacts. He was able to group the finds into two more fine-tuned periods. There was the Havana style with a strong dentate patterns. That's these series of lines, lines you see on the artifacts in the lower right, left, lower left corner. Um, 
that Havana style um, fits into the middle woodland period. There were also collared ware ceramics found and those were manifested in the late woodland period. He was a also able to show that there were stone tools dated to both of these periods found at the DU-33 site. And this just strengthened the dating for that. So we don't have just pottery, we've also got stone tools for both middle woodland and late woodland period. Um, then he was able to go further and show that these, the ceramics and the tools were not just separated by time, middle woodland and late woodland, they were also separated by location. The concentration of finds found at the southern end of the site, so say the 1976 excavation, those were from the late woodland period. Whereas the concentration of finds from the 1975 excavation, the uh, four by four grid system, those were middle woodland periods. Um, he was also able to date the um, effigy mound triad to the effigy mound tradition. And this dates them to from 800 to 1100 CE. And this was based on the construction methods used to create the earthworks and the description of the bundle burial mortuary practices that Newman had described, and also the lack of grave goods but that both Jennings and Newman reported. So, sorry, I can't see the bottom part of my face. <laughs> okay, and so, um, whoa. sorry about this. Oh, okay. Then in September of 1989, this is actually important, so I'm glad I looked it up. So in September of 1989, Cullen formally published a paper in the Wisconsin Archaeologist describing the Winfield Mounds and village site. So 58 years after the University of Chicago excavation and 13 years after the Wheaton College excavation, the site was finally documented in a peer review uh, journal. In order to bring attention to the mound site in the early 1990s, Cullen began giving tours of the site. These were sponsored by the DuPage County Forest Preserve and they were pretty popular. There were about 25 to 50 people attending on each, ex each tour. Um, the tours were useful because they were able to educate the local population to the existence of the mounds, their archeological and cultural significance as well as the need to restore them and protect them. Later on, these tours were taken up by a naturalist from the DuPage County Forest Preserves. In the late 1990s, Cullen and a group of local archeologists were given permission to restore the mounds by the DuPage County Forest Preserve. And the Forest Preserve didn't just give them permission to restore them, they helped with supplying the materials, the logistics, they helped to clear the undergrowth and made it so that the guys, the archaeologists could actually do the restoration. The restoration was all done by hand. No machines were brought in and materials were very carefully placed into the mounds to restore them as close as possible to the original site. Was this an exact science? No, but it was definitely a best effort. The DuPage County Forest Preserve then put in an interpretive sign. Now this photograph is looking northwest across the mound site. The center right is DU3 here, restored. And the in the lower left corner, you can see the back of the interpretive sign. The inset at the top is the front of the interpretive sign. The text of that was written by Cullen and the artistic renderings were done by his father. So Brian now will continue with the story of where the Winfield Mounds goes from here. Thank you. So we're running a wee bit late, so I'll try to get through this fairly quickly. 
Um, the work has not stopped. Uh, they've continued to study the Winfield Mounds because there's still a lot we don't know about the people that live there and the way that they lived and so on. And an example of that is uh, Peter Geraci of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, who we are in constant contact with, um, much to his chagrin, uh, has been studying the Wheaton College artifacts. And he's been able to place the, uh, Wheaton the uh, Winfield Mounds artifacts in context with many of the other sites in Northeastern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin. So this is a diagram that uh, Geraci uh, produced and he's trying to put the Winfield Mounds in context. The red are uh, middle woodland sites, or early woodland sites, the yellow is middle woodland and the green is late woodland. But in any case, he's trying to put Winfield Mounds in context relative to the Fearson Mounds along the Fox River in Kane County the Adler Mounds along the Des Plaines River in Will County, the Bowmanville Village site uh, in Cook County along the Chicago River, as well as the Couch site. The Couch site is just a short distance to the north of the Winfield Mound site, also on the west bank of the west branch of the DuPage River. So uh, he's trying to understand uh, how this fits, how this particular site fits into the larger context. And one of the things that he's brought out, for instance, is in the Winfield Mound site, there is a preponderance of natural springs, and he believes that the, the existence of these natural springs, which Native Americans may have held sacred, um, may have been a reason, one of the reasons why the Winfield Mounds were built where they were built. The other thing that's noteworthy about, if you look at this diagram long enough, you realize how many of the habitation sites are along the major river systems of Northeastern Illinois, the Des Plaines River System, DuPage River System, Fox River, Illinois River, and so on, which is uh, stands to reason because this is where the indigenous people lived. So what do, how do archeologists interpret the Winfield Mounds? Well, they break the archeological record in North America down into major periods, the Paleo, the Archaic, the woodland and the Mississippian. And you can see that some of these span vast amounts of time, thousands of years. So they tend to break these down into uh, subperiods, early, middle, late, particularly for the archaic and for the, the woodland period. And these periods represent substantive change in the material culture of the people that uh, lived in this area and change related to things like tools and technology their settlement patterns, their habitation patterns, their trade networks, the extent of trade that they made with other people, as well as their mortuary practices. In other words, all of the things associated with culture. And as Joyce said, the artifacts that have been collected, the descriptions of the excavations indicate at least two distinct cultural affiliations with the Winfield Mounds area from the middle woodland and from the late woodland, spanning a period of roughly a thousand years. And notice that when we talk about a village site, we're not talking about a permanent village site which with continuous occupation. Archeologists re would refer to this more as a habitation site where groups of extended families might roam across the countryside in a nomadic lifestyle, and they might uh, encamp in a particular area for a few months or a season of the year, then move on to another location to exploit the resources in that other location. And so this habitation site was a, a place that was revisited multiple times over the course of, of a thousand years or more by indigenous peoples because it was a favorable place to live. And uh, because it uh, the mounds in some respects uh, put a, a stamp on the landscape for, for at least the, wood, the, the late woodland people. So what do we know about the, the middle woodland? Well, it's characterized by long, the growth of long distance trade networks for things like copper. And this particular large chunk of copper by what is in the St. Charles History Museum. And it was found in the context of other Native, Native American finds. And it probably came from upper Michigan um, upper Wisconsin area where there are copper mines and the Native Americans did uh, mine copper in that area. So it was brought down via trade to this particular area in the middle, likely in the middle woodland period. Things like uh, the mineral mica would have been traded 
shells from from many places far away, different types of stone that would have been used in the manufacture of projectile points and so on. This is also the time where there's a, like a blooming of, of uh, artistic cultural expression in the middle woodland. You start to see some beautiful pieces of carved wood and carved mica and so on in this time frame. So this is a really a flowering period in the, the middle woodland of the culture. Spears and atlatls were the weapon of choice. Most people, when they talk about arrowheads, um, so arrowheads that are perhaps one inch or larger, most people refer to those as arrowheads, but they weren't they weren't arrowheads unless you come from the Middle Earth and from the Lord of the Rings. Um, they were way too large to heft onto an arrow shaft, um, but they were perfect for uh, hefting onto a four to six foot long spear that would be thrown with a, a spear thrower in it ladle that this gentleman's demonstrating right there. And that gave you great mechanical advantage and you could throw for great distance and speed with a, with a spear thrower if you've ever tried one. And I suggest you try one if you haven't. The atlatl was used even up into the, by the uh, uh, Aztecs when Cortez came along and the, the Aztecs used them to great effect against the armored Spaniards. It pierced their armor without any trouble. They could throw these, uh, these large projectile points made of stone uh, through some of the armor of the Spaniards at that time. So that was nothing to uh, didn't have anything on uh, bow and arrows, if, in case you're wondering. So the atlatl, the spear thrower, was the primary weapon of choice. The mortuary practice at that time was largely large conical burial mounds where uh, there'd be a central ancestor buried in the center of the, the, the mound in a, a wooden tomb uh, with wooden logs. And then subsequent burials would be buried around that, usually flex burials, but inhumation burials. So the, the body was laid out in the grave as inhumations. And then the, the earth was mounded on top of that. And so these mounds tended to grow over time and become, uh, some became uh, quite large with, with dozens of uh, human burials in them. And as Joyce pointed out, the Havana ware, the Havana Hopewell uh, culture, the Havana ware was, that was found as part of the, the, the Wheaton College excavation in the 1970s points to the fact that uh, there was a middle woodland presence at the Winfield Mounds site. And what about this Havana ware that uh, Colin identified? So these are a few fine examples of some of the Havana ware that was found at the Winfield Mounds site with the, the indentations made with a stick or perhaps a fingernail. And the Havana Hopewell culture extended uh, through the Illinois River Valley as well as the upper Mississippi River Valley through Northwest Illinois into Eastern Iowa, Eastern Missouri, Southern Wisconsin. And you can see DuPage County would have been in the Northeast frontier of uh, the Havana Hopewell culture. We also talked about the, the, the late woodland period. And what is that characterized by? Well, it's characterized by the we start to see agriculture, the three sisters, maize, corn, and squash. More settled communities results from uh, this agriculture. This is where the bow and arrow starts to come in. And this is where we see arrowheads becoming, this is the projectile points becoming one inch to a half inch in size. And it took a lot of skill and craftsmanship and flint napping skills to be able to create those very delicate, very sharp, true arrowheads. So remember, a lot of the times, if you're seeing a projectile point that's an inch or bigger, that was probably a dart point or a spear point. You start to see more refined pottery and ceramics. So this is a, a bird effigy bowl. You can see how thin this, this ceramic is, how thin that clay is. And remember, Newman found a piece of pottery from a bowl that was 3 16 of an inch thick. Nobody's suggesting that it was a fine piece of pottery like that, but it was a fine, finely crafted piece of pottery which strongly suggests it was the, the late woodland. So there are three indicators, oh, in the, uh, I should mention too, the mortuary practices of the late woodland were cremation burials and bundle burials, just like they found in DU1. Now a bundle burial, burial if you don't know, is where they usually leave the, uh, the, the, the body out uh, and the flesh decays from the body, excarnation it's sometimes called. 
once the flesh has decayed away, they gather together the, the, the remaining bones. They're not too careful about picking up all the bones. They pick up most of the bones, put them into a satchel of leather or cloth, and then bury that in the ground. That was a bundle burial. That's why it was referred to that way. And that's, that's what Newman believed he saw in DU1. So the three indicators of late woodland at the Winfield Mound site, Joyce already alluded to this, the ceramic sherds, as well as the stone tools found by Wheaton College, the effigy mounds, which can be firmly placed in the effigy mound tradition, uh, also as part of the late woodland, and the bundle burial in DU1, again, part of a mortuary practice of the late woodland. So effigy mounds. Uh, what about them? Uh, one person was asking uh, the difference uh, between these and other types of mounds, and, and we'll talk about that momentarily. But the construction of the mounds, how they were constructed, their height, their size, their placement in the landscape on a bluff, as well as the lack of grave goods and burials within that mound for the most part, or all the mounds, strongly indicates it was part of the effigy mound tradition, which was part of the, the uh, late woodland culture. And the effigy mound tradition, as Joyce mentioned, lasted from about 800 CE to roughly 1000 to 1200 CE. And it was centered, this is a nice map drawn by John Martin Kelly, it's centered in southern Wisconsin. So this is the effigy mound tradition in the late woodland time frame. And it went all the way into eastern Minnesota and eastern Iowa and northern Illinois. And once again, DuPage County is on the southern frontier of the effigy mound tradition. And this is this notion of these frontiers is something that Doug Cullen also pointed out. Now, these effigy mounds came in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, they came in the shape of birds, animals, serpents. Most effigy mounds, however, were conical. They were round or oval-shaped. The vast majority, in fact, were, were round or oval-shaped. They were typically were clustered in groups of a few to many dozens along a bluff top. They were typically one to three feet high. And these mounds here, believe it or not, were uh, surveyed by a man by the name of Theodore Lewis, a, an archaeologist in 1894. These were on the east bank of the Fox River, just a mile north of Aurora. So he found uh, perhaps a, a few dozen mounds and, and recorded and mapped them in 1894. And these are the drawings from that. So lest you think that there weren't other mounds of this type in the area, there were. And this particular bear mound is one that came from uh, Alamaki County in, in Iowa. But this is just to show that there was quite a wide variety of different uh, mound shapes. So what can we say in the end about uh, the Winfield Mounds? Well, first, it's unique. It's the only re remaining documented set of effigy mounds in the entire county. Effigy mounds and burial mounds would have been common along the the Splains River system, the DuPage River system, the Fox River system, uh, throughout northeastern Illinois 200 years ago, but almost all have been destroyed by industry, agriculture, housing, etc. They've all been wiped away. And of the ancient earthworks of made by indigenous peoples, which include platform mounds, think about Cahokia. If you've ever been to Cahokia, the massive platform mounds. Uh, the burial mounds, think about the Dixon burial mounds, think about the St. Charles or Fearson mounds along the Fox River on the west bank of the Fox River. And finally, effigy mounds. Effigy mounds continue to be the most mysterious. Archaeologists only have a vague understanding of why they were built or what they meant to the people that built them. Uh, based on the evidence, they don't appear to be asso directly associated with mortuary practices. Um, most effigy mounds do not have burials in them. Uh, the majority do not have burials in them. However, some do. So that suggests that there might have been at least an indirect link to mortuary practices. One hypothesis is that each mound represented an extended family. And perhaps the shape of the effigy mound was the totem of that extended family. That's just a hypothesis. And so the effigy mound may have played a role in the rituals of that family, for both the living and the dead. But that is simply a hypothesis which is very difficult to test because the archaeological record 
doesn't provide any answers for those sorts of questions typically. We also know that these mounds would have been very important to the people that made them because it took a lot of labor, community effort to build these mounds. Uh, and this is a time when most of your time and effort was spent in the act of survival. So spending the time to build these mounds means what they meant to these people. We also know that this location, DU-33, was also a favored place for them to live. They came back numerous times over the course of thousand years to live here because of the natural rich resources that were all around them in the marshland and the forest, the river, and so on. Finally, based on the observations made by Doug Cullen, we know that this location would have been something of a remote outpost for the Havana Hopewell culture uh, in the middle woodland and for the effigy mound tradition in the late woodland period. And so we might know a little bit about the, the, uh, the personalities of these people because living in a frontier area, you might have, you probably had to be a little bit brave and adventurous to live in such an area where everything beyond that is part of the unknown, different cultures, different people beyond this space. So they had to, to be a bit adventurous and brave hearted. And that's something that we do know about them as well. So that's the end of our formal talk about the Winfield Mounds. Um, if you'd like to learn more, you can visit our YouTube channel where we talk in more detail about the Winfield Mounds, also about the Fearson Mounds in St. Charles. You can visit the Winfield Mounds yourself. Uh, they're fairly easy to get to, so we would suggest people do that. You can also visit, visit the DuPage County History Museum, which has a nice collection of Native American artifacts, or the St. Charles History Museum, which also has a great collection. And you can read the primary sources to learn exactly uh, what some of the excavators found, as well as to read Doug Collins' excellent article from September 1989. So I guess now is the time for Q&A. Okay. Um, so right, so, so if you you can share that mic and we'll come around with this one. There was one question uh, from our virtual audience that I thought we might ask, and that is how are uh, effigy mounds uh, handled today? I, we learned about what was done uh, in this case, but yeah. how would they be handled today? So that's a very good question. And I think archaeology has changed quite a bit in the past 50 years. And um, it's highly unlikely that an archaeologist would dig into an effigy mound today. One of the reasons being is that they, that they know there's probably nothing to find in the, the uh, no artifacts to find per se in the effigy mound itself. The mound itself is the artifact. I think that's a little bit too hard, difficult to get your head around. The mound itself meant something to the people uh, that built it. Um, so the idea of finding elaborate grave goods or burials in these in these mounds, these types of mounds, uh, is is not very likely. So you'd have to have an extremely good reason to dig into an effigy mound today. Uh, for instance, if it was salvage archaeology, where it was going to be bulldozed for a housing development or something of that sort, you might dig into the effigy mound and find record what's there at the very least. But aside from that, I think most archaeologists would be loath to dig into an effigy mound today. Okay, thank you. I will just take maybe one or two from our in-person audience. Um, yes, yeah, I believe you said that they there was an effort made to rebuild and restore these mounds. What kind of protection is being uh, put there now so the dirt bikers and the diggers and everybody doesn't ruin them again? Well, uh, that's a very good question. So how are they being protected today? Um, I, I'm not aware of any other protections except for the honor system uh, where the the DuPage County Forest Preserve requests people treat it with respect and, for instance, not to take their bicycles back in there. We've been there back there many times in the past 15, 20 years, and we have not seen any pillaging at, that we've personally witnessed. The DuPage uh, Forest Preserve might know differently, but we haven't seen anything. Also, the fact that um, I, I think it's fairly well known, if anybody was actually interested in, in this, they would know that there's nothing there. Um, you could dig all you want, and uh, you might find a Coke bottle from the University of Chicago dig, but 
um, you're, you're not going to find uh, uh, any artifacts because they've already been removed or because there was none there to begin with. Um, so that, I mean, that's a very good question. I don't, I've never seen anybody patrolling the area or anything of that sort, but I think if I saw somebody that was digging in that area, I'd certainly report it to the DuPage County Forest Preserve. Um, and I would encourage anybody else to do so as well. If you see somebody digging uh, that isn't a member of the DuPage County Forest Preserve, it doesn't have uh, permissions and they shouldn't be back there. Um, I mean, we, we've seen from this mound site as well as many other, other mound sites in the area, the destruction that's caused by pot hunters. Um, they want to collect things, but not at the expense of destroying this information, which once it's gone, as Joyce said, archaeology is by nature a destructive science. And once it's gone, it's gone. It, it can never be recaptured. So um, uh, we hope that the honor system continues to work, but we don't know. Okay. Thank you. Let's take just one, one last question. I thank you. Um, were they ever were they ever able to determine from the test pits and stratigraphy? Soil stratigraphy. Yep. Yeah, it's a in, difficult word to say. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a. I'm, I'm new at it. But in '31 and then in the '70s, were they ever ever able to determine or rule out that the area immediately around the the, the mounds had not been plowed? Well, they can they can often tell by the depth of the the hummus or hummus 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 yeah. uh, the the topsoil as to whether it's been plowed, um, and the, the it was rather shallow topsoil in this area, um, only about six seven inches deep, so it didn't appear that it had been turned over in any significant way and mixed in with the clay and so on that was beneath it, so that strongly suggested that it had seen little plowing over the years. Um, and, and the, the mere presence of these mounds that lasted into, I mean, you, you saw the photograph yourself in the 1930s, that clearly is a mound. I mean, looking at that that picture, um, and it's, it's a terrible shame that it was destroyed in the name of science, but it was destroyed effectively. So, and uh, as we've tried to emphasize, the mounds themselves were the, the effigy mounds were the artifact themselves, and they had some sort of spiritual significance to the people that built them. And that's the best we can know about them. And uh, they marked their their identity in the landscape, so to speak. Um, but I think I'm, I'm going a field, far afield from your question. So I apologize for that. All right, well, thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. And uh, just as a reminder to our virtual audience, I will be sending out a follow-up email either later tonight or tomorrow morning with some follow-up resources. And everyone will receive a direct link to the recording of tonight's program uh, in an email as soon as it becomes available. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, if you would like those resources and are watching the recording, please email me at ce at wheatonlibrary.org. That's ce for community engagement at wheatonlibrary.org. And I'd be happy to send those out to you. But thanks again for joining us. Good night. And we hope to see you again soon.